Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. When I was a kid, uh, my dad had this junk drawer. Anybody got a junk drawer in your house? It was an awesome drawer. Had this junk drawer, and uh, I, I would rummage through it, you know, finding all sorts of really awesome things. I'm never forget one time. My dad was a principal of a high school, and I'll forget rummaging through there one time. I found these Chinese throwing stars. I was like, these are awesome. And I'm out, you know, throwing them at the wall and the tree and, you know, getting them to stick into stuff. And my dad, I found out he had confiscated them from a kid and he told the kid, you know, get your dad to come and you know, claim them and I'll give them back to you. But I think the kid's dad didn't know he had them. So uh, he never, we got, I, I got to keep those stars and I was like, oh, these are so cool. Another one I came upon one day was uh, these mirrors. And there were these mirrors and they had a, a big X in them. And I said, what is this? He said, oh, these are what they gave us in the military in, the, in case we ever were in a plane crash or something and we got stranded. They're signal mirrors. So what you do is you take it and you get the sun on it and then you start to shine it up high to catch the attention of rescue crews that are above. And I didn't understand why you would need that. Uh, but I, a couple of weeks ago, my brother-in-law, he picked me up in his little plane and he flew me from Kerrville down to San Anto- or to Corpus Christi. And I realized, man, once you get up in the air, it's hard to see things down there. But with these, with these mirrors, what you do is there was a little X on it and you'd get the sun to reflect off it, and then you would aim it right at that airplane to get attention. You're just trying to dr- attract attention. Like, hey, I'm down here. Now, the longer I live, the more I'm convinced of something. I am convinced that we humans are reflectors like a mirror of what we are looking at and what we are looking for. I believe that all of us have this thing within us, you know, the the Bible compares us to a light. I believe that's reflected light. And we're all looking for something. And, And what ends up happening is sometimes we're looking at something or looking for something so bad. And because of this reflecting nature of us, we're looking at it and we end up reflecting on others this irritating light. In fact, when, when, I, when I was discovered how wonderful these mirrors were, it, it, I, I discovered also it was super fun. Uh, I did something a little mischievous. We lived right on a highway. And uh, I would climb up into this tree and I would get these, this mirror and I'd hide up in the tree and I'd wait for the sun. And as drivers were going by, I'd shine the light in their eyes. And it was just so fun. I'd hear honks and people flipping us off. It was just, you know, a five-year-old's dream, six-year-old's dream. Till my grandpa came along one day, he's like, don't do that. That's irritating to people and you might cause an accident. And I, I've met people, I don't know about you, but I'm guessing you've got a few people in your life that every time you get around them, it's kind of like they do this something that's so glaring and irritating. It's like having a, the sun shined in your eyes and you're like, oh, what is wrong with them? They're so irritating. You ever been around people like that? They just, it's like they're like shining a mirror in your eyes. Like, quit, quit being you. Don't do that. It's very irritating. Because there's something within us that, that's, that's always reflecting what we're looking at. And here's what I've found. Deep within us, there's a couple of things that we're always looking for. And you guys, if you've hung around me for more than about 30 minutes, you've heard about this. Okay, this is nothing new. Uh, if this is new to you, uh, don't worry. Uh, there's a book, a whole book I've written about it. It's in the back, okay? This little sh- shameless self-promotion here. The book's in the back. I'm going to blow through this really fast, but if this is intriguing to you, there's more information on this in the back, but here we go. Every one of us, we're born looking for three specific things. God made us to need three specific things. We all need security. Security can, can look different for each person, right? We need a sense of security about like physical safety. We need financial safety. We need emotional safety. We just want to be safe. And there's nothing wrong with you for wanting to be safe. God made you that way. We also all want a sense of connection. Connection is this feeling of feeling esteemed, valued, seen, heard. Every one of us, we want that. We want somebody to know like I exist and people value me. And then we all want a sense of control, which is maybe the better word would be empowerment. I want to be able to make my own choices. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I want to have options. We were made to get all of these straight from God himself. 
Those things were supposed to come from God, reflect on our mirror, and we would reflect total security on those around us because we got it from God's love. But what happened, of course, as we've been looking at through the series, is the sin of Adam affected all of us. When Adam sinned, it says, now we have all sinned and we fall short of the glory that God intended for us, the light that we're supposed to shine on the world. We all fall short of that be- apart from Jesus because of our sin. But fortunately, it says, we looked at that first week, it says, through one man, Adam, sin entered the world. Through one man, Jesus, our entire lineage was set free from the bondage and the power of sin. And that's the hope we have as Christians. No matter what you've done, Jesus came to make your relationship right with God when you surrender yourself to him and ask forgiveness of what you've done to offend a holy God. The challenge we face, and this is what we've been talking about in this series, is that we all get our image of what God looks like most of the time from the first godlike figure that we had around us. So for, that may have been your, gram, your grandparents, whoever raised you, your aunt, uncle, your mom, your dad. And we get our pictures about what, who God is from those people. But those people have the same problem you and I do. They have a sin problem. (laughs) Just like you fall short of the glory of God, your parents fell short of the glory of God. And in their best day, I had pretty good parents. They fell short of the glory of God. And so they couldn't do it right. So we bear, we carry this imprint around on us of what our wrong image of God, what, how it affected us. And what ends up happening is because we all need these things, we had flawed parents. They couldn't give us these things. So what, what we oftentimes are looking for is the thing we never got growing up. And remember, you reflect what you're looking at or looking for. So you've met people that run around and they're obsessed with security. And they're just, I need security. I need security. They're worried about financial security. And you're like, dude, you've got millions in the bank. How much is enough? Just a million more. Just a million more. Then I'll be financially secure. Dude, you've got walls around you and you've got uh, security cameras and, and guns and how much more security do you need? Just a little bit more. Because they're reflecting what they need. Is that irritating to y'all? So I'll stop shining light in your face. <laughs> but that's what happens. And there's some people that are just so obsessed. I've got to get security because they didn't get it growing up. So there's this hole and they're like, oh, I need security. I met this girl one time and her, her dad had made some bad financial decisions And um, she said that ever since she was like 10 years old, she would save her allowance because one day if her family got in a bind again, she wanted to save them from the the bind with her, you know, $2 allowance. She lived with this perpetual fear of not having this safety. Um, What's, I talk about this in the book, security, when you don't feel security, what your big fear is of being abandoned. So you've met those people that run around always worried about they're going to be abandoned. They're just like reflecting that on the world. And you're like, what is wrong with you? Oh, he's going to leave me. I just know he's going to leave me. Well, why are you saying that? There's no indication. Well, because everybody leaves you. You ever heard the saying, if, if, if you've, all you got is a hammer, everything becomes a nail? You begin to see what you're looking for. So you see abandonment everywhere, okay? For some people, it's this, this connection corner. And, and so the response is security. When you don't have security, you feel abandonment. And the response is to go inside yourself and become self-absorbed. And that's where sometimes you look around, you hang around people and they're so self-absorbed. It's like everything is about their schedule and you plan something and then they don't show up. And you're like, why are you, we all planned this. The family planned this. We've all got one, one sibling like this, right? One sibling that everybody, the family plans the thing and the one sibling's like, I'm in and then they don't show up. And you're like, what happened? Well, I just decided to do something else. Anyways, it's maybe a security thing. The connection corner, when you don't feel connection, your big fear is rejection. You ever met people that run around just flashing that like they're terrified of rejection? I heard a guy one time tell me, he said, well, I, I never fear rejection. I just reject others before they reject me. Uh, whoa, hello. Somebody's reflecting something. So when you're afraid of not being valued or esteemed, uh, I had a guy the other day I was just doing a little transaction with and he, he got offended and he felt rejected and I, I sensed it immediately. Um, I'm not super sensitive in this area. I'll show you my area in just a second. But I saw that that was a big deal. And so he turned into this jerk to me because he had felt rejected by me. And I realized, I was like, I made the mistake. And here's this guy projecting his rejection. And he's like, oh, just like I thought, he rejected me. And when you have this rejection corner, the response to that is typically addiction or self-gratifying behaviors. Uh, so and I can... I can usually spot people in this corner. They all tend to do CrossFit. But anyway, 
Uh, I'm just kidding, sort of. I actually had a girl, a girl one time, not, not a knock on CrossFit, I love CrossFit, but I had a girl one time that was telling me she did CrossFit and she runs, uh, she runs a, an, an Ironman every six weeks. I was like, what? An Ironman triathlon every six weeks? And I was like, yeah. I was like, have you ever struggled with addiction? Because typically those extreme behaviors are a result of this because you're going to connect with something. And she's like, oh yeah. She's like, I was in rehab by the time I was 15. And I was like, that's what it is. So that outlet for her, instead of the addiction, is the addiction to the adrenaline rush of the Iron Man. So it's better than, better than drugs, I guess, right? I'd prefer the drugs. All right. So <laughs> did I say that? No, I'm just kidding. I've never taken drugs in my life. All right. This is my corner over here, okay? Tylenol. I have taken Tylenol. And sometimes when I'm really going crazy, Advil. So... <laughs> This is my corner over here. Okay, so I grew up as a pastor's kid and I was constantly under scrutiny. It wasn't because my parents were so hard. It was the, 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 the people around the church. I'll never forget, I was running one time in church and this lady's yelled at me. She's like, you are grieving the Holy Spirit running in church. <laughs> she was wrong, I found out later. <laughs> But I would have this constant scrutiny about what people thought I should be. And so I was always worried about being controlled. I mean, this has been a major issue of mine throughout my life. I have to control everything and I don't want to be controlled. Uh, in fact, Pastor Marcus, when he asked me to come on board here, I was like, no, I, I can't work at a church. He's like, why? Is that? Cause I said, because the church will control me. And he's like, he's like, no, I won't control you. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Everybody wants to. Remember, everybody wants to control you. That's all I see. That's my thing. And everybody's like, why are you such a freak? Well, it's because I'm afraid of being controlled. And that's what I'm reflecting on the world because I'm always worried, who's going to control me? And everybody's like, well, you got issues. <laughs> and it's because this is being reflected. So we're always reflecting things. We're reflecting what we don't have. And, and, and this is where the Apostle Paul steps in. He says, guys, you're going to reflect something. You're going to reflect what you, what you didn't have growing up. You're going to reflect, you know, what you want, but, but here's what you actually need to reflect because the things that you're looking for, that security, that connection and control, the only going to place they're going to come from is the one you were designed to get it from in the beginning, which is the perfect love of God, which offers security, connection and control. If you're looking for security in a spouse, I've met young ladies that are like, oh, I just, I just need to find a guy. My dad was so abusive and I need to find a guy that's going to give me emotional security. And they end up getting in another abusive relationship, but they feel emotionally secure. I know he's not going to leave me, but they're in this abusive relationship because they, they, they're, I need security. I need, and the crazy thing is these sharks will hunt on that. They'll see, oh, this person needs me. And so they know they can get away with abuse. And, and you see these people. And, but, but in the, in the middle of all this, Paul is saying as a Christian, you need to recognize this. As a follower of Christ, your relationship with God has been restored. All the security, all the connection, all the sense of control you're needing, if you're looking for it in money or who you have or what you know, you're always going to come up short. It's never going to be what you need. You may have the best husband in the world, but he can't love you the way you need to be loved. But the love that you need is going to come straight from the Father. And that's where the Apostle Paul we pick up this verse we talked about at the start of the series where we look at what faith looks like. And we're going to connect what faith looks like and living in God's love and reflecting that love to the world because that's our next step in this process of freeing our father. Look, God came and set our family free from the power of sin and shame. So we now cover the, our, our family's shame like God covered your shame through his, his grace. That's what we talked about in week two. In week three, we talked about um, carrying on the good work of our father. And this week I want to look at what we do now is we stop looking at what our father and mother weren't or our aunt and uncle weren't or the people who raised us weren't. And we start looking, because remember, if you're looking at that, that's what you're going to reflect, what people weren't. And we start looking up and lift our eyes and go, oh wait, everything I need comes from the love of God the father. And that relationship has been restored because of Jesus. And that's where Apostle Paul, he says, look, Guys, I want you to look. He says in Hebrews 11, he, he lives, it's this, Hebrews 11, if you read the chapter, it's called the Hall of Faith. 
That's what, we, that's what I've heard it called. Where they talk about Abraham and Moses and, and Jacob and all these guys who lived their life by faith. And he says, look, these are all guys that lived by faith that God is who he said he was and will do what he said he's gonna do. But then he wraps up Hebrews 11 with this interesting line that's so fascinating. He says this, all these guys I just told you about, they were all commended for their faith. They all did it. They were great. They lived by faith. But none of them received what had been promised because God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. You go, wait, what? What does that mean? And I, I don't understand the full depth of this because it's heavy stuff, right? And I'm, I'm, not, I'm no theologian, but here's, here's what I think this is saying, that there's an element within us that has the responsibility to be the people who share the freedom that has come through Christ. In fact, there's this other verse that Paul says, which we're like, what does that mean? He says, I fill up in my body what's lacking in Christ's suffering. You go, wait, what? Christ's, sa Christ's sacrifice was perfect. Yes, but what's now required of that sacrifice is for you and me to live out to the world. It says we are Christ's ambassadors telling the world, You've been set free from the power of sin and death. So rise up and become all you can be. You, were, you fell short of the glory of God, but now no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has perceived what God has in store for those who put their hope and trust in him. And that's our message now. And he says, so guys, Jesus saved every, Jesus set the, the course and he set it to where people can come to God again. But our job is to now live out forgiveness of those who have come before us and what they didn't give us and stop looking at what they didn't give us. And this is what he says to do. Now, this is what's crazy, okay? So Hebrews 11 ends right here. Now, in, if you're reading your Bible, you pick up Hebrews 12, which starts with this. But you know what? In the original version, there were no Hebrews 11, no Hebrews 12. It was one long letter. So Hebrews 11 fits with Hebrews 12. So he says, guys, only together with us would this be made perfect. Like you've got a responsibility to do in this. And then he says this. So therefore, since we have surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, since so many people have come before us that have walked this path of faith, here's what you need to do. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let's throw off our anxiety. Let's throw off our fear. Let's throw off our worry. Let's throw off all the stuff that's been hanging on to us and all that other sin that entangles us. And let's do this. Let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And here's how you do that. You fix your eyes on Jesus, the author, it says the pioneer, is this version, the, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So it says, if you want to run this race well, you're never going to run it well looking at what you didn't get, because then you're just going to be reflecting all that's the lack onto the world. If you want to run it well, you need to lift your vision up and realize who you're running towards. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And here's what it says. Look at him, because he was the example. You know, Jesus was the example of how to live in harmony with the seen and the unseen realities of our existence. He was the example. If you want to know how to deal with the challenges you're facing today, look to him. If you want to know how to deal with COVID, look to him. If you want to know how to deal with all this crazy stuff going on in our government, look to him. He is the answer. Amen. So what, how, how? Well, we're going to look at that in just a second, okay? It says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. You know, we, we discipline the ones we love. My dad used to, right before he would give me a spanking, my dad would always say this, son, this is going to hurt you a whole lot more than it hurts me. But you're going to be glad I did this later down the road. Because if you really love someone and you see them going down a path that's not going to go well, the most important thing you can do, the most loving thing you can do is correct them. You know, if I see somebody's kid running around and I don't care, like whatever, I'm not gonna say anything to somebody else's kid, but man, my daughter, if I see her running out in the street, I'd probably say something to somebody else's kid too, but, because <laughs> I'm a good person, right? <laughs> but when you really love someone, you say, man, I don't want that for you in the future. And sometimes what ends up happening is we're tired and we're exhausted and we say, ah, whatever, it'll work itself out. But it doesn't work itself out because love requires you stepping in and disciplining sometimes when you see people going wrong. 
And that's what he's saying here. He's like, that's what discipline, uh, when you love someone, God is treating you as children when you discipline them. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate. He's saying you're an illegitimate kid. Not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respect them for us. Now, I know some of us had fathers who didn't discipline in a loving way. They disciplined out of their own anger. And you start to get a picture of discipline. You say, that's not a good thing. Listen, it, discipline is a good thing, but just because they did it wrong doesn't mean it's not, a, it's not a good thing. But your heavenly father knows exactly the discipline you need. And it says, how much more should we submit to the father of the spirits and, light and live? God who loves you and knows you and created you knows exactly what kind of discipline you need to get where you want to go. They disciplined us for a while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for good in order that we may share in holiness. He wants to make you in his image. Instead of the image of what your parents couldn't do, he says, I want you to start looking at me and that imprint is going to come on you and then you're going to reflect that imprint to those around you without even trying. Amen. You're not going to have to try to be good. It's just going to flow out of you because you've got your eyes fixed on me. And I'm the author and the perfecter of that faith you're trying to live. I'm the one that's going to be the source of it. Amen. It says here, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And, and, and you know this, right? I don't understand why God set up the world this way. But we learn and we grow the most through pain. I wish that working out and getting strong involved eating Krispy Kreme donuts. I wish God was like, hey, you want to grow strong? You want to get those calves just the way you want them? Eat Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> that would be awesome. But it doesn't work that way. He set it up. In fact, he says, where pain is actually what grows us. I talked a few weeks ago about this idea of anti-fragility. So anti-fragility, there's this, there's this economic concept, but it, it works across the board that there are three kinds of systems in the world. There are fragile systems. Fragile systems, they break when they're exposed to stress. So you think about a vase. If you drop it, poosh, it's done. No more vase. What do they say? If you drop your keys in a, in a river of molten lava, let it go, man. It's, they're gone. Anyways, that's a Jack Handy quote. But... <laughs> Let it go, right? So that's a fragile thing. It breaks. Then there's robust things. Robust things are like this, right? Like you kick it and you punch it and yell at it and nothing happens to it. But fragile and robust are not opposites. The opposite of fragile is something that actually gains from stress and disorder. And it's something called an anti-fragile system. An anti-fragile system gains through disorder and gets stronger. And you know what? You're an anti-fragile system. God made it that way. That's how Paul can say we rejoice in our suffering because we know suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Man, if you've ever gone to work out, you know you've got to tear a little bit of that muscle to make the muscles stronger. If you've ever broken a bone, if you can get it set right, and that's the thing about anti-fragile systems, they've got to have time to recover for them to grow back stronger. And so sometimes what we're doing is we're scrambling and fighting and God's saying, I just need you to rest a little bit because the struggle you've been through, if you'll rest, you're going to come back stronger if you'll stop trying to fight and do it on your own. But if you don't give it time to heal, it won't come back stronger. And here's the other thing about an anti-fragile system like a human being. If you treat an anti-fragile system like it's fragile, it will become fragile. If you treat kids like they're super fragile and protect them from all pain, they will become fragile. Now, obviously, you don't want to, you know, this is where it takes wisdom. You don't just abuse them. But there's certain amounts of bumps and bruises and scrapes that you've got to let your kids face. There's a book called the, uh, oh my gosh, Jonathan Haidt, that's what it's called. Anyways, he wrote this book basically saying um, that we've, we've made our kids weak because we've tried to protect them from speech they don't like to hear. I don't want to hear that. that. That actually makes them weaker. Hearing things that make you uncomfortable actually make you stronger. And that's what God set the world up to function, how, how he set it up to function. There's this element of discipline and pain and suffering that actually makes us stronger. And you know this because look, you've been through a lot of stuff and you're still here. And you go, I don't ever want to do that again. But I wouldn't be who I am today apart from those struggles. 
And that's what Paul's saying here. He says, listen, discipline does not seem pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. I've told you guys about how a few years ago, I decided to start doing intermittent fasting where I, where I only eat during a six hour window every day. And it was horrible. It was miserable. But I felt like for my health reasons, I wanted to start doing that. And, and um, man, I, I had never fasted up, up to 40 years old. I had never fasted what well, I'd tried. I'd set out to like do a three day fast and I'd get through a day and a half of it. And that's where I've told you before, guys, before sometimes I wondered if, if that made me a half fast Christian. Half fast Christian. <laughs> Half fast, like I get, couldn't get through a whole fast. It was a half fast. Get, get your heads out of the gutter. Anyway, it was hard, man. I was so hungry and angry and frustrated. But now I'm like, man, it's helped me get stronger. It's helped my immune system be boosted. And it's discipline. I had to discipline myself to not eat during those windows of time. And I like eating. But I love the fruits of it. And the same thing is true in the struggles you're allowing, the disciplines that you're using in your life. Any discipline that you use is actually going to bring peace for those who are trained by it. So he says this, listen, guys, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. He's saying, guys, it's time that you start recognizing the struggles and the pain and suffering you're going through for what they are. They're God disciplining you. He's allowing the things. Did he bring those things into your life? I, I don't know if he brought them, but I know for sure he allowed them. And here's the thing. He allowed them in your life because he knows that through it, if you'll look to him, you will begin to reflect his image to the world around you. You will reflect your father and you will get stronger. And this, there's no time like now, guys, in this world we live in. We are surrounded by fear and anxiety and anger and rage. It's a bunch of people flashing around. I'm mad. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'm irritated. I'm this, I'm that. I'm scared. And everybody's doing this because they're all looking at what they're, the thing that they fear, the thing that they're angry about. And Jesus is saying, guys, it's time that you fix your eyes on me and let me be the light that's reflected. And that's what discipline's about. It's, this is the time to discipline your mind, your heart. In fact, the word discipline, it says training that corrects, molds, or perfects. That's that holiness it said in that verse we just read a second ago. It's God's wanting to make you holy. And you know, that's where the word disciple comes from. We're called to be his disciples. And the only way you're going to be a disciple in this world right now is to turn off the TV, stop watching the news and all the negativity. Sure, be informed. But turn off all the negativity and start looking to your heavenly father. Amen. That's what Jesus himself did that. Right. Jesus said this. He said, guys, don't, don't be mistaken. Listen to this. Very truly, I tell you, he says, you got... Don't ever forget this. I'm Jesus, right? I'm the son of God, but don't ever forget this. The son, me, I can't do anything by myself. He only does me. I only do what I see the father doing. I only reflect what I see the father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show even greater things than these so that you will be amazed. And I believe that's a promise for all of us. If you'll keep your eyes fixed on the Father in the middle of all this chaos around where it's threatened, COVID's threatening your security. It's threatening your connection with others. It's threatening your sense of, of control. The government situation, everybody's terrified the government's gonna do all these things. And what if the government mandates this and this? And we're all afraid. And it's, listen, you can focus on that and you'll just be like everybody else, just irritating everybody. Or you can become a weapon of righteousness and peace in this world Amen. when you go, all right, I'm keeping my eyes off all this junk around here. It's Christ who lives in me. That's how you let your light shine before men and they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And this is the time, you guys. The struggles we're going through right now, they're either going to make or break you. I believe they're going to make you. That's right. It's going to break some people, but not you. Because you're fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. And you're seeing the discipline for what it is. It's him saying... Strengthen your arms and your knees. Get up, stand up, put your, stand up straight, put your shoulders back and walk boldly and confidently while everybody's chicken in and out around you. Right. This is your time. This is your moment. Be courageous and brave. See the discipline for what it is. God is making you into the glorious image of his son, Jesus. Now I'm all pumped up. All right, let's pray. If you are ever in the Seguin area, 
come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.